Uh, thank you, James. I'm delighted to be on Nantucket. It's my first time, and it's beautiful. So um, I'm pretty wired up. If I slip out of sound, please tell me. And I've been given some very modern technology, which if it doesn't work, please tell me. Also, I just admitted to DR, lovely camera woman. I've already seen my first spelling mistake. I've misspelt my own name. <laughs> that is not how you spell Christine. <laughs> I was doing it quickly. Please forgive me. I do know how to spell my own name. <laughs> so anyway, I'm delighted to be here, James. Thank you for persisting. I l would have loved to have come in March, but delighted to be here when I'm pretending there's sunshine. <laughs> there isn't so much yet. I I've just come back from Ireland. We've had the hottest summer ever. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I do come from Quinnipiac University, the unpronounceable university in Connecticut. But you may hear from my accent, I've sort of moved around a lot. My family, I explained to the ambassador, uh, were from Mayo and Tipperary. They emigrated through poverty to Liverpool. When I became a teenager, I wanted to return to Ireland, so I went to Trinity College in Dublin. After a few years, I moved to Belfast and then moved around. And five, no, 10 years ago, I came to America, and five years ago, I moved to Quinnipiac. So I have moved around quite a bit, and my accent probably reflects that. Um, we were speaking with the ambassador before about a wonderful Irishman, John Hume another wonderful Irishman. And the ambassador was saying you, know, his message is that unity comes through accepting diversity. And to me, that is exactly the message preached through Frederick Douglass. And just hearing what Molly has planned for this year, I think it's wonderful because Frederick Douglass, as we know, he didn't know, is 200 years old this year. Um, if you did know it, he is dead. <laughs> But you know, to agree, he is doing wonderful work. He is incredible. And he may be dead, but I think very much his legacy lives on. So you have a wonderful program, Molly. It's great. Um, and my own speciality is his relationship with Ireland, which was enduring and I think very special. So I'm going to talk about that relationship. How did I say, you know, how did I, an Irish historian, come to Frederick? So, I am a historian of Ireland. My speciality, which I've written about, is the great famine, as we know it in Ireland, more generally known as the great hunger within the United States. I'd written a number of books on that. At some stage, I was asked to write a book on Daniel O'Connell. You may have heard of him, our liberator. And I had some skepticism about O'Connell. But anyway, I was to put together a series of documents about him. Um, while doing my research, I came across his work as an abolitionist. Now, you know, through, as an Irish historian, I know him as somebody who brought about Catholic emancipation, as, some, as somebody who tried to bring independence to Ireland. But as an abolitionist, I didn't really know him. And that really intrigued me. And I went on to write a whole book about Daniel O'Connell as an abolitionist, The Saddest People the Sun Sees. And through Daniel O'Connell, I came to the great Frederick Douglass and Douglass's relationship with Ireland. So that's how inadvertently I came to Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass, fugitive slave, civil rights champion. And if I can just start by talking about things at Quinnipiac this year. Um, if you are in the vicinity, please come and visit us. We have a Great Hunger Museum, which has the largest collection of artwork devoted to the Great Hunger. It's currently in Ireland, Skibbereen. It doesn't come back till next April. But on campus, we have a Frederick Douglass exhibit. It will be there till next March. It's open to the public and it's free. And it explores his time with Ireland. So the booklet outside is actually about that exhibit. It really talks about the exhibit. One of the features of, of our exhibit is this beautiful statue. And this is a statue of Frederick Douglass when he came to Ireland. It's unusual because most representations of Douglass depict him as an older man, as the older statesman, the grizzly herd, white herd statesman. This depicts Frederick as I know him as a 27-year-old 
fugitive slave who came to Ireland. So this is the young Frederick. This statue is by an English sculptor. It's deeply symbolic. It's the cloak is the cloak of Daniel O'Connell, his great hero. The waistcoat, um, you may call it vest, is the vest of Abraham Lincoln, who he came to have a friendship with. And the outstretched hand is exactly modeled on the hand of President Obama. And in his left hand, he's clutching a copy of the narrative. So it's a beautiful, powerful statue, unusual because it's Frederick speaking as he loved to speak, he was such a great orator. It's also impressive, not only is it impressive because it's so dynamic, but because of its size. It's almost nine foot by nine foot, which is great, except it did not fit in our library. <laughs> <laughs> so the exhibit is in our main library. Frederick is at the law school. So we are spreading the love of Frederick around campus. But um, anyway, so I hope you come and see this exhibit. Um, if I can also sort of promote myself, so I have been, Interested in, my children would say, obsessed with Frederick Douglass for almost 10 years. And when I came to know Frederick, I started casually and then very ardently, I suppose, transcribing every speech he made while he was in Ireland. And he made almost 50 speeches. So this has taken me some time, but just this month, my two volume book on Frederick has come out. I don't have it for sale because it's expensive, so I'm not recommending anyone buy it. But yes, but just so you know, you, I have also done that. And through transcribing his speeches, and you, as Molly said, his early speeches were not written down. So I've constructed them from newspaper accounts in Ireland and multiple newspaper accounts. I came to feel I really knew the young and incredible Frederick Douglass. So I always feel very close to him. So if I call him Frederick tonight, it's because you know I feel I know him anyway. And I feel he sort of found me, which is maybe presumptuous. But anyway, so that's my connection with Frederick. So um, I'm sure you know a lot about him already, but just in case you don't, he was born in Maryland, 1818. But as was common with slaves, he never knew his birth date or in fact, the year of his birth. When he was asked how old he was, he would say, I think I am, and he would approximate. He thought he was born in 1817. It wasn't until after his death we found out, or it was found out, he was born in 1818. His mother was a slave. His father, it is thought, was her master. So he was of mixed race. As I said, he didn't know his birth date. During his young life, he saw his mother about six or seven times. She worked on a different estate and would come sometimes to see him late at night. But he later recollected at one point she referred to him as my little Valentine. So as an adult, he chose the 14th of February as his birth date. But again, we do not know his precise birth date. Um, his birth name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. And Bailey to me sounds very Irish, but again, we don't know much about that particular connection. But when he escaped out of slavery, he changed his name to Douglas after a Scottish hero by Walter Raleigh. So we know him as Frederick Douglass. Escape. Um, again, our Ireland was always so important for him. And he talks in his narrative about working on the docks in Baltimore. And on the dock side, he encountered two Irish dock workers who praised him. He helped them and they praised him for his kindness and said, a fine young lad like you should not be a slave and they encouraged him to go to the north. And at that point, he wasn't sure what that meant. And he wasn't sure if they were tricking him. But at that stage, he knew he could not be a slave for all of his life. And so he determined that he would escape. And when aged 20, he escaped to the north. Now, most slaves who escaped were told to follow the North Star, because how else would they know to get to the north? But he escaped by a different route. He'd met a young, free black woman, Anna Murray, and she, at great risk to herself, gave him the clothes of a sailor and the papers of a sailor. And so under that guise, he was able to escape to New York. He was there joined by Anna and the two of them married, 
and at that point he changed his name to Douglas. And escaping was very high risk because if you were caught, and he tried to escape before being thrown into jail, but if you escaped again, you would be branded on the cheek. And if you escaped a third or fourth time, you would be castrated. So the punishments for escaping were extremely harsh. When he escaped, he and Anna settled in New Bedford. Again, this was a brave choice. He chose New Bedford because like Nantucket at the time, it was a Quaker community and Quakers were great abolitionists. But many slaves who escaped chose to go to Canada because only in Canada would they be truly free. But he said, no, going to Canada is not an option. I have to stay and fight for the freedom of my other fellow slaves. And so in New Bedford, he worked on the docks, he encountered prejudice, but he dedicated himself also to abolition. Now, at that time, it was illegal to teach a slave to read or write. But as a young boy, he'd had a mistress who taught him the ABC until her husband intervened. But he had enough knowledge to develop his own literacy. So he was self-taught. And he, very early on, had realised that education was his pathway, his ladder to freedom. So even though he came, he worked as a dock labourer. At this point, he was very educated. And at this point, he started to become interested in abolition and to purchase Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator. And he started to attend abolitionist meetings in New Bedford and the New Bedford area. So, 1838, Frederick always claimed that he had heard of Daniel O'Connell first in 1838. And O'Connell, as I said, was a great abolitionist. In 1838, the new American ambassador to England had been in London, had seen O'Connell and introduced himself to the great Daniel O'Connell. And O'Connell said he refused to shake hands with any American until he knew his stance on slavery. But he already knew about Ambassador Stevenson and he refused to shake his hand on the grounds he was a slave breeder. And the ambassador was un furious and challenged O'Connell, who was then almost 70, to a duel. And O'Connell refused, but this issue reached the newspapers and it was played out in the newspaper columns in Britain, in Ireland, and of course in America. And of course it divided public opinion. And Douglas said that was when he first heard the name Daniel O'Connell. And he said, I heard my master lambast him and I knew if my master hated him, that I should love him. So that was Douglas's first encounter with O'Connell. So, Nantucket. And Nantucket, like Ireland, is very important in Douglas's personal development and history. Douglas at this stage had been interested in abolition and he was persuaded by a Quaker banker abolitionist on the island of Nantucket to come to an abolitionist, an annual abolitionist meeting. And so he came to Nantucket. And it's sort of appropriate in some ways that the weather prevented me from being here in March because I'm here in August. And it was actually in August 1841 that Frederick Douglass came to the island of Nantucket as a spectator at this great abolitionist meeting. And the convention lasted for three days and it was multi-race. So this is where Frederick spoke in the, and I hope I pronounce it wrong, Athenaeum. Is that how you say it? Okay, Athenaeum. And this is the original building. Um, sadly, it burned down the Great Fire on the island, I think 1846. Local historians can tell me if I'm right. And it was rebuilt. So Frederick spoke in the original Athenaeum. And his intention was not to speak originally, but he was called on because his great life story. He was unusual, and he was somebody who for the first 20 years of his life had been a slave. Somebody who had actually been whipped. He later talked about the scars on his back for his impotence. So he had a very compelling story to tell. And he writes in his narrative that he was called on to speak, and he stood up, and he spoke reluctantly, and he thought he was stammering, and his knees were shaking. 
but his great oratory and his compelling story mesmerised the audience. And in the audience there was, of course, the most famous abolitionist of the day, William Lloyd Garrison. And Garrison heard this young former slave speak and invited him to be a lecturer for the American Anti-Slavery Society. And he was the only former slave to speak on their behalf. And Garrison was initially very cautious. He invited Douglas to perform this role initially for four months, but again, because Douglas was so amazing at what he did, it was made a permanent job. And so at this point, Douglas became a lecturer on behalf of this society and lectured throughout the so-called free states. But although they were called the free, sorry, the free states, Douglas could never feel totally safe because the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 meant that at any part of America, of the United States, a former slave was, he was by law compelled to go back to where he'd come from. And people who harboured him were found guilty of crime. So Frederick never felt totally free. And now here he was actually making himself very public, drawing attention to himself to his public lectures. So again, he felt it great, doing it at great risk to himself. And at this point, he and Anna had some small children. So again, a very brave thing to do in the context of the time. So Fred Garrison, this is Garrison. This is actually a photograph of Garrison taken when he was in Ireland in 1846. And Garrison said to the audience, have we been listening to a thing, a piece of property, or a man? And what did the audience all answer? A man. And exactly, and often during the course of his speeches, especially when he was in Ireland, Frederick would refer to the fact that as a slave, as a fugitive slave, he was not a man, he was not a citizen, he was simply a chattel or a colour. So, and this is the great Frederick. And this is an image of Frederick, but we have from a later period, many photographs of Frederick Douglass. And you probably know he was the most photographed man in America in the 19th century. And in the 1840s, photography was in its infancy, but as he got older, Frederick became more and more photographed. And he used photography in a very deliberate sense because he believed it was an instrument of democracy because the photographs could not lie. And because Negroes, black people, slaves had been so stereotyped in such a negative way for so long, he believed that photographs actually provided true representations of them. And if you look at photographs of Frederick, he's always immaculately turned out. He had a great sense of style and of dress. But also, unusually, he looks directly at the camera. And at the time, this is very unusual. And again, it's very, very deliberate. And this is Frederick saying, I may have been a slave, but I am a man. This is me. This is what we are. So he used photography in a very, very deliberate way. So he returned to Nantucket two more times, 1842 and 1843. 1842, the speakers were attacked by a mob. Now, again, this was not unusual. Around the same time, Frederick was traveling on a train and had been dragged off the train by an angry white mob, and his right hand was broken. So being attacked was not new for him. 1843, he came back, and at that point, they weren't attacked by a mob, but there were internal divisions, and over the issue of the Sabbath day. At that point, it changes, but at that point, Douglas, like Garrison, believed that the Sabbath day was not special, that each day was a special day to worship. That was very, very controversial at the time. So, Frederick, he made all these public appearances, he traveled extensively, but he achieved notoriety. And people could not believe that this young man who was so articulate, who was so immaculately turned out, could have been a slave for 20 years. Moreover, a slave who claimed that he had been badly treated and whipped. And so he was persuaded to write down his life story. Now, slave narratives were not unusual. 
This was not the first or last slave narrative, but it was probably the most popular in terms of sales and notoriety. So in May 1845, Frederick Douglass's first autobiography narrative was published. And it's very interesting because it includes a preface, as was well the tradition, written by a white man. And that person, of course, was William Lloyd Garrison. But in the preface, William Lloyd Garrison refers to the great Irish abolitionist Daniel O'Connell. So again, Frederick Douglass is very aware of this Irish man, Daniel O'Connell. But it was a double-edged sword. It brought some income, it brought more fame, it brought attention to the abolitionist movement, but it also put the young Frederick Douglass in danger of being captured. And his master at that point said, we are going to bring you back. This is what you deserve. And so at this point, Frederick was persuaded he needed to leave America. And he was persuaded by Garrison he should go to Britain, because in Britain, slaves were free. And in Britain, there was an, abolition, an abolitionist movement that Garrison wanted to actually create and strengthen the transatlantic ties with. So Frederick, even though he now had four young children, sailed from Boston to Liverpool in August 1845. He sailed with a fellow abolitionist, a white abolitionist, James Buffum, and with a group of singers called the, and I've suddenly forgotten their name, I've remembered it, the Hutchinson family. And they were singers from New Hampshire. It was four brothers and one sister. And they, again, were very progressive in their politics and their outlook. And they sailed with Frederick and they attended a number of anti-slavery meetings with him in Britain and Ireland. And it was the first time there had been music in these gatherings. So it was very unusual for people in Britain and Ireland to hear music. And just, I know, because Molly talked about at one event you're going to have music and it's so appropriate because Frederick was so musical. He loved music. Um, he liked to sing and in Ireland at a few of the abolitionist meetings towards the end of them, he burst into song. And he also heard while he was in Ireland some Irish laments. And he said that it reminded him of the music of the plantation. And he always held that with him. It was very close to his heart. And after he left Ireland, he went to Scotland and there he felt homesick. And with his income, he bought himself a violin and he was self-taught to play the fiddle. And he said whenever he play, whenever he felt homesick, he would play the fiddle and he would feel as happy as a cricket. <laughs> and just in case I forget to say this later, um, he actually taught his young grandson, Joseph, to play the violin. And Joseph Douglas became the first black concert violinist in the world. So the legacy continued. So Frederick was very, very musical. So back to Ireland. Frederick arrived in Liverpool at the end of August 1845. He stayed there two days and then he and James Buffum took the boat to Dublin. Why? Because a Quaker printer abolitionist in Dublin, Richard Webb, had agreed to reprint a copy of the narrative. The day that Frederick arrived in Ireland, he wrote back to Garrison, he said he was safe in old Ireland. And for Douglas, this was a remarkable feeling because while in America, he never ever felt truly safe. But now for the first time in his life, he could feel safe. Also, and this is really important, during his life, Frederick had never felt he was honored or treated as an equal, even when in the so-called free states. And again, he wrote to Garrison saying that in Ireland, for the first time in his life, he felt an equal. I find myself not treated as a color, but as a man, not as a thing, but as a child of the common father of us all. And again, this is very important because this sense of freedom and equality provides a springboard for Frederick to find his own voice in so many ways. So Frederick, he's in Ireland and he has many highlights. Um, Frederick, as an abolitionist, was also, like many Quakers, like many abolitionists, was a great supporter of temperance. He never drank and partly he wanted to always be in control of his body, his self, 
but he attended many temperance meetings in Ireland. And he also met the great champion of temperance, Father Matthew, and took the pledge from him, even though he didn't drink anyway. He met the mayor of Dublin, who invited him to dine at the mansion house in Dublin. Again, something that would never have happened in America. And of course, the great meeting was with Daniel O'Connell, his champion. And he later said, I, stay, I came to Dublin for four days, but I stayed for a month because I hoped to meet the great Daniel O'Connell. And towards the end of his time in Dublin, he did indeed meet O'Connell. And he met O'Connell because O'Connell was speaking in Conciliation Hall about repeal, and Frederick went and heard him speak. And he said, of all the speakers I've ever heard in my life, I've never heard one as great as Daniel O'Connell. And at the end of the speech, Frederick had been at the back of the hall and was moved slowly to the front. And John O'Connell, Daniel's son, said, meet my father. And so Frederick met his great hero, Daniel O'Connell. And at that point, O'Connell invited Douglas to get on stage and speak. And Frederick Douglas was such a great speaker, but he was also very modest. And he started off in his usual self-deprecating way, saying, I'm not good enough for you. You are also great, and I'm not worthy. And then went on to make the most amazing speech. But his speech was important for a number of reasons. In it, he praised the great liberator, the great champion of Ireland, of Irish civil rights. But in it, he also said, and to me, this is very important, he said, what my people need is a black O'Connell who will come and liberate us. And that idea that we ourselves need to liberate ourselves, I think is really, really significant. And then he finished his speech by saying three words which became associated with him. Agitate, agitate, agitate. And I have to say it was a phrase he stole from Daniel O'Connell. <laughs> But he made it his own, because you probably know his famous um, philosophy that power concedes nothing without a struggle. And O'Connell again knew this idea, agitate, agitate, agitate. O'Connell believed that you should never use violence for political ends. And again, this was to have a great influence on the young Frederick Douglass. So Frederick left Ireland, January 1846. Again, at that point, he wrote to Garrison, and he reflected on his time in Ireland. And he reflected on the poverty he had witnessed in Ireland. Now, at that point, nobody knew that Ireland was about to undergo seven years of devastating famine. Nobody knew that. Frederick Douglass did not know that. But he witnessed poverty. And again, he likened the poverty he witnessed in Ireland to that that he had witnessed on the plantations. And he said, you, I came here as an abolitionist, but now I know my struggle has to be beyond abolition. The struggle of human rights is the same the whole world over. And so again, Ireland was very pivotal in his education. And he also in the same letter wrote to Garrison, I can truly say I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. And again, that idea of being safe, free, and equal was so important to the young Frederick Douglass. So Frederick, after he left Ireland, he went to Scotland. There he became involved in the campaign against the Free Presbyterian Church in Scotland, which had taken money from slave-holding states. And he urged them to send back the money. It wasn't totally successful, and while in Scotland, it's very obvious he did become homesick. And as I said, in Scotland, he purchased a fiddle to try and cheer himself up. From Scotland, he went down to England, and while in England, some women abolitionists, some women were very important in the abolitionist movement, actually purchased his freedom. And this was very controversial, the idea of purchasing his freedom. Some of his fellow Abolitionists said, this is wrong because we're paying lip service to the idea you were owned in the first place. But he explained, I've been away from home. I need to return to my family. I need to return to my country. And so in April 1847, that's exactly what he did. And on the return home, return journey home, 
just as on the journey to Liverpool, he was not allowed to travel as a first class passenger because of his colour. So despite all he'd achieved in his 18 months away from America, he was still subject to so much prejudice. Significantly, when he got back to America, he moved away from the orbit of Garrison. Again, I would argue, in Ireland, he found his voice and his agency and his independence as an abolitionist. And so he and his family moved to Rochester. He had a number of female friends in Rochester. So he's far away from Garrison. And in Rochester, he started his own newspaper, The North Star. And again, something that Garrison didn't like because Garrison had his own newspaper, The Liberator. So he was in direct competition with his former mentor, Garrison. So he came back shortly afterwards to Nantucket. He returned to Nantucket in 1850. And in 1850, a new, more draconian fugitive slave law was introduced. And so Frederick, while in Nantucket, spoke out against this new law. Of course, he was unsuccessful and the new law was introduced. So later life, what did Frederick do? He fought not just for abolition, but for equality. One of the first things Frederick had done when coming back to the United States was to attend the Women's Conference in Seneca Falls in 1848. He was one of the few men to attend and to sign the Declaration of Sentiments, and he was the only African-American man to do so. So again, a first for Frederick Douglass. And when he came back after Ireland, after his time in exile, he campaigned for human rights for all. As you know, he advised a number of presidents, including most famously President Lincoln during the Civil War. Um, initially, he was very skeptical about President Lincoln's intentions, but after 1863, became more confident that he was genuine. When Lincoln was assassinated, Mrs. Lincoln gave Douglas her husband's favorite walking stick. So I think that speaks of their great friendship together. So 1885, Frederick comes back to Nantucket. At this stage, he still doesn't know his age, but he's in his late 60s. He's an old man. And in some ways, his speech reflects some of his disappointments, the fact that even though there had been a civil war, his people did not enjoy equality. There was lynching, there was Jim Crow. So in some ways, he was disappointed. And he spoke at that point about all the friends he had lost. He also spoke about his former friend, John Brown. You all know about John Brown. John Brown, who led the rising at Harper's Ferry. Frederick tried to dissuade him, but when he couldn't, he gave him some financial support. And apparently the final words that Frederick said to John Brown were, I will meet you in heaven. And I hope that happened. Um, so at that point, when in Nantucket, 1885, Frederick spoke on these themes, and he also again urged that ending slavery in itself was not sufficient. There needed to be true equality. So he asked he, for that. He almost begged his audience for that. So Frederick died 20th of February, 1895. We now know he was 77 years old. That day, as was appropriate, he had attended a meeting in Washington for women's suffrage. And while there, he got a standing ovation. He came back to have dinner with his wife before going back to the meeting. And on leaving the house in the hall, he was telling his wife, Helen, about the day's proceedings. And she said he became very animated and then he fell to his knees. And she thought he was play acting because he had a great sense of humor and he loved to play act. But sadly, he'd had a massive heart attack. And so he died at his home with his beloved wife, Helen. Um, so, to conclude, Frederick Douglass never forgot Ireland. As an old man, he returned there in 1887. And he said, I'm going to Ireland to look at the faces of my friends who looked after me 40 years earlier. Sadly, they were all dead, but he stayed with their children. And at that point, he came out in support of Irish independence. 
and on his return to America, he spoke at a home rule meeting in Washington, saying, Ireland wants its independence, and in justice, Ireland should get its independence. And Ireland have never forgotten Frederick Douglass, I'm happy to say. There is a wall mural to Frederick in Belfast. There are plaques to Frederick in Waterford and Cork. We're working on getting one in Dublin. And in fact, in getting a statue to Frederick in Belfast. So we have not forgotten Frederick. And as I would say, he may be dead, but the gift, the wonderful gift of Frederick Douglass is very much alive today. Thank you.